So today I'm going to talk about uh, the, the public markets from both an equity perspective and M&A perspective. I can't do 26 slides that fast, so I'm going to go a little bit slower. <clears throat> Inman also told me I'm not allowed to use a six-point font, banker font for these, so I'll, I'll expand each one of these. So first, let's take a look at, at the performance to date. Um, the reality in the ec public equity markets is it, it hasn't been all roses this year. Um, as you see in, in certain subsectors, pr predominantly transportation, energies, utilities, it's been a bit of a challenge uh, year to date. Healthcare has actually hung in there uh, with, a, with a positive performance uh, this year at, uh, at just shy of 5%. Um, the reality is a few months ago that was, that was uh, substantially higher. Healthcare has actually taken a fair amount of the brunt in the most recent pullback, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. What you see here is actually um, <clears throat> an important slide around the, the volatility index over the course of 2015. What you see is for the first really seven and a half, eight months of 2015, relatively flat or normalized volatility. And what happens during that time is we've actually had, to the point that John made, a significant amount of new issuance, right? IPOs, follow-ons, um, across healthcare technology, et cetera. But when we got to, to, into, into August, you see the spike substantial. Now, most of us remember that because over several weeks' time, period of time, we saw the Dow move uh, a couple thousand points down, back up, down, back up. And, and what that really does is two things, right? So we may look at that and say, well, net of that was actually zero or actually in some cases still a positive market. But that volatility does two important things in terms of, of equity issuance. First, when you're in the middle of it, for most of these investors, they stop focusing on new investments, right? They start focusing on managing the volatility within their existing portfolio of investments. And that's why you see a change, and we'll talk about this later, in terms of the outcomes of these deals. At that point, they also really start changing their sentiment. And there's a human dynamic here, right? So the silver lining on this page is, if you look today, volatility is back to normal levels, actually quite attractive levels, and you'd expect a return of issuance to correspond with that. But there is a human element here that is sentiment driven. And so when investors go through a shock like they did in August and September, which by the way is one of the worst volatility periods we've had in the last six years, that lasts. And that's what we're still seeing today in terms of not nearly as much new issuance going into the marketplace. The other piece of the equation for investors is to think about fund flows, right? 2013 and 14 from a public equity market perspective or public equity investor perspective was very strong in terms of fund flows. Almost 250, a little more than $250 billion went into U.S. equity funds during those, that two-year period of time. In the second quarter and third quarter combined, we actually saw a significant amount of that capital come out of these funds to the tune of about $107 billion. This, again, they still have a very awash in cash, especially with some of the M&A we were talking about. A lot of that money has come back into their funds. But this plays on the psyche as well in terms of looking at new deals and how they're thinking about deploying new capital. Finally, we look at the, during the third quarter, as we think about going forward, where is corporate America from an earnings perspective, the health of, of corporate America, the actual facts. What you see on the blue bars is that about a third of the companies thus far reporting in the third quarter have actually exceeded expectations on the revenue and 70% on the earnings. But about half have actually disappointed. The way I read this is, you actually, this is, this is a mixed report. You can't see a trend from this in terms of where corporate America's uh, health is coming out of the third quarter, which in ter turn, for most investors, says they want to stay relatively neutral in terms of how they're thinking about exposure and what they're doing. So where do we go from here in the equity market from a, from a macro perspective? Well, <clears throat> the pessimists and optimists at this point in the cycle have a, about an equal weight, and that's why you're seeing day in and day out a bit of a push and pull in the, in the markets. The bulls are, are, are finding a, a thesis around continued constructive outlook on U.S. labor and growth, modest inflation, uh, inflationary pressures, um, an economy, accommodative Fed uh, on the margin, uh, and that they believe corporate earnings are still grow strong and that the, the leverage still exists within U especially U.S. corporates. Uh, and they believe that the volatility, as we showed in the earlier slide, is starting to subside. The bears are still pointing to the same things we saw in August and September, right? They're pointing to Fed tightening in December. They're talking about China uncertainty, commodity volatility, oil, and some of the things that even impacted the markets yesterday, as well as global growth and geopolitical concerns. What we do know are two sort of, I think, relevant facts. On the 
left side of the chart here, you see that from an earnings and forward PE perspective, at 16 times for the S&P 500, we're well within the realm of historical norms. And far, when people talk about the bubbles of the late 90s and early 2000s, you can see where the earnings were for the S&P 500. It, it peaked at almost 30 times. We're still at 16, right? Now, on the right-hand side, people will point, though, to say that's somewhat dependent upon the quality of those forward-earning estimates, right? And what you see is in the Q3, actually some a, a degree of that, those, those estimates being brought in, while people will still remain optimistic about the forward-looking numbers that are out there. So it remains to be seen, and that's why you see the, the, the bears and bulls lining up on both sides of each other in a market like this. Looking at biotech and medtech training performance over the, over the last five years, obviously it's been a strong overall market for five years straight, actually a little longer than that, whether it's, you're looking at the S&P 500 or medtech or biotech. Even the last two years have been extremely strong, and these have created a lot of tailwinds in terms of, of, of activity in the market. But year to date, the S&P has been largely flat. Healthcare, as we looked at earlier, has been a little bit above that, and biotech and medtech are, 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 are no different. So now I look at it within the ophthalmic community, right? I think this is really interesting. It says a lot about the, many of the folks in the room. Um, over the last two years, on a relative basis, the S&P 500 up 17%. The diversified and ophthalmic companies, so uh, the, the larger uh, names in the space, are up almost 30%. But the pure play, or relatively pure play ophthalmic companies, they're listed in small font down below, are actually up 53%. Where this matters, I think, is that when we got into the 2008, 9, and 10 time frame, and many of the larger names in this room and, and as a part of this industry were consolidated as part of larger companies, public investors got a bit stale on this market and what's going on in ophthalmology, right? The success of the companies listed here and several others that aren't, that were driving that 53%, have brought those investors back into looking at ophthalmology as an attractive asset class, right? They've seen the M&A exits, which we'll talk about. They've seen this success. And we saw it. I mean, a good example was the Glaucos transaction in June. Um, the number of investors and the amount of excitement that were around a high-quality story that was coming out of this community uh, was, was robust, and we saw it in the outcome of that deal and, and the subsequent trading performance. From an M&A perspective, John uh, spoke to it, so I'll, I'll go quickly through this. And the way we, we look at this data, MedTech M&A has actually been relatively consistent since 2010. You're seeing about uh, 45 to 50 deals get done a year of various sizes. On the biotech side, it's a bit, it's, it's fewer because those tend to go into the public markets first, but you're seeing somewhere 15 to 20. In 2015, you did see thus far a pretty big spike in the biotech M&A. And from an ophthalmology perspective, this is not all the deals that have been done, but obviously you see a good mix of transactions both on the private side as well as the larger public side getting done. From an IPO perspective, <clears throat> the blue bar again, biotech. Obviously, 2014 is a year we've never seen before, right, in terms of, of new IPOs on the biotech side. 64 deals got done. Even this year, with a pullback at 33, is the second largest number of IPOs that have been done in that sector in the last 10. MedTech had been gone, gone through a long period, a long quiet period. But in 2014, we saw that recovery, and we saw all those IPOs getting done, and most of those have performed quite well, which gives us a, a, a fair amount of confidence in terms of continued success for MedTech IPOs. So it is worth, though, looking at where we're at today. And, and one of the ways we measure the health of, of the new issuance, issuance market is to look at the outcomes of IPOs, right? Over time, whether you look at it 2014 or 15, and this is the outcome of the IPO relative to the pricing range that was initially established, you see a, a good mix, as you'd expect. About a third of those companies get done above the range that they initially wanted to. About a third get done within it, and about a third get done below. And over the course of 2015, you saw that trend still largely holding true until we got to the period of volatility we were talking about. And what's happened in September and October is not only have the number of deals pulled back, um, but you've seen uh, outcomes markedly change. So it's that in October, we actually had 100% of the deals fell below the range. Ophthalmology has, has had a bit of a renaissance in the public markets, right? Um, after many years of, of limited uh, new issuance, we've seen uh, at least nine companies, or I think there's probably a few more, um, that have gone public over the last uh, couple of years, most of which are having uh, a lot of success in the, in the public market. And as I said earlier, that's driving uh, renewed interest in, in, uh, in, in new company stories. And finally, uh, you know, when I think about key success factors uh, going forward for especially the private companies here and going uh, from a public market perspective, I say it's not fair, but biotech and medtech have a different set of standards, right? From a medtech perspective, it's still all about scale, growth, 
de-risking from a reimbursement FDA perspective, having a, a, a tangible pipeline that folks can, can get behind when they think about longer-term models. But on the biotech side, it's much more about valuable lead products that they can see the market potential and the positioning uh, over a longer period of time. I think I'm out. Well, I'll leave one last thing, which is something John said. The critical component we're seeing more in the last two years than we've ever seen before is the crossover investor. John had great stats on that. It's become the path to an IPO. Uh, for most successful stories, they've had that. So thanks for the time. Thanks, Emmett. Appreciate Thank it. You.